thank you. And it's really a pleasure and an honor to be here and talk today and, and to be here for two days and to listen to the different uh, talks. And um, with the, I'm actually currently the Director of Research Education in Environmental Science at uh, Södertörn. And uh, the environmental science there is truly multidisciplinary. So we have um, research projects spanning from understanding ecological processes with environmental genomics to studying environmental governance and policy documents using phantasmatic logics. But they all have the, get their PhD in environmental sciences. But one, except for having environmental sciences as a common theme, also it's the applicability for society, which is an important part of the research. And um, I'll talk today about this hidden biodiversity in ecosystems. And it's based on a research with a number of um, collaborators. And I'm not going to go through all of them, but there are different various international collaborations. Uh, so the, the challenge in the society uh, is this um, um, challenge of, of having sustainable ecological systems social systems, but also economic systems. Not only for the generations today, but also for future generations. And this you recognize as the sustainability concepts. And in this, it's important that we have uh, knowledge and solutions for, for being able to reach a more sustainable society. And some of the examples could be a better understanding of the biodiversity's role in ecosystems. Um, and for example, using environmental um, genomics or diagnostics to understand this. Could also be uh, biotechnological, more green um, applications. So it could be we just heard about GMOs as re um, alternatives to using chemical, a lot of chemical um, compounds. Uh, could be variants of these GMOs, so alternatives to chemical pest control. Um, more sustainable global health. There's an urgent need for novel antibiotics globally. Uh, and also climate impact address transitions for moving from um, to the post-petroleum uh, society, which I'm not going to touch about because I know you've spoken a lot about that um, previously. So uh, the ecological processes, uh, they, they depend on all the organisms, the biodiversity in the environment. And these organisms, how they interact and, and um, depending on the genetic and physiological fitness um, makes them then um, s adapt to environmental change. But often, conventionally, the focus on biodiversity is plants or animals. But actually, if in all these systems, you have the forest system or a field system or under the water, the true diversity are those organisms that we cannot really see. So those are the microorganisms. Um, so globally, the biomass is, is dominated um, by microorganisms. And the, the genetic diversity, but also the metabolic diversity, is dominated by microorganisms. So microorganisms, they drive uh, um, carbon turnover, nitrogen fixation, 50% of the oxygen, we have on Earth is produced by microorganisms, the great toxic compounds. Uh, you've heard about the importance in, of microorganisms in gut for our health. Um, so these microorganisms have had time, 3.5 billion years, to all evolve into different metabolisms. And these are metabolisms are highly attractive then for application. In for various production of um, biocompounds and so on. So uh, this figure here shows how the microbial communities, the genetic information, um, then encodes for various ecosystem functions that are global ecosystem functions. So we have the carbon dioxide uh, cycling, um, methane, gas production and so on, so that are really important. Um, so understanding and analyzing this genetic information 
could g at least give us an indication of capacity for ecosystems. But with more recent these sequencing technologies that we have today, we understand that the diversity is even larger than we expected previously. So this is a um, it's difficult to see, but it's Jill Banfield in the US recent um, uh, analysis of all kingdoms, all life domains that we have. It was published last or two years ago, um, and it shows actually that more or less all of this, these are microorganisms. And we have Eukarya here, and we can't even see where we are. <laughs> so uh, it just opens even more the awareness of, of uh, the diversity. And in addition, the, you can, might see some red dots, and these red dots represent lineages that have never been cultured. So also the vast diversity has been inaccessible. So this is the hidden diversity that we have. So uh, it's like a microbial storehouse, a warehouse for various metabolic functions. So um, one of the trajectories in the understanding awareness of the incompleteness of knowledge about this diversity has uh, led to large collaborative efforts. So one of the efforts that we've had is um, the Earth Microbiome Project. And this project um, was over 500 th um, scientists, thousands of samples that have been collected and an analyzed. And these have been separate individual studies with each different hypothesis. But the important part is that all these efforts have been done in coordinated protocols uh, and standardization and databases, which then has made it possible to have this, like a framework for comparative analysis. So not only this, the individual studies, but also possibility of understanding more global trends and global functions of these microorganisms. So this was recently published uh, by Thomson et al. And um, here it shows thousands of various samples from environments ranging connected to humans also, but mostly in animal distilled in guts, soil, sediment, water, um, air, plant, rhizosphere, and various parts around the world. And so, so many of these studies are actually drawing on ecological theory and, and trying to understand um, drivers behind ecosystem processes and diversity patterns. But also, it's information that gives us more a hint of what kind of metabolisms are available. So the access to these hidden organisms, we cannot culture them, is what was mentioned also by Stefan Storr, the metagenomics, environmental genomics. Could also be uh, extracting the total genomes from environmental samples. So one little tablespoon of soil is more or less like 50 human genomes of microbial genomes. And um, Yes, so my main focus otherwise is actually more understanding the uh, ecology. But for a number of years, now 15, 18 years, we've been also using for um, bioprospecting and production of biocatalysis. And uh, I guess this figure is mainly to show that there are like two major paths, just using the genetic information to see capacity, to see metabolic uh, functions, functional capacity, but also actually having the biocatalysis in, like a cell, using cell factories. And the global enzyme market, there's a, a large industrial demand for many of the enzymes that are naturally occurring, like chitinases, esterases, lipases, hydrolases, um, rhodopsins, lactases, uh, pectinases, all for biopharma, for bioenergy, food and beverage, beverage uh, waste management, um, and also more currently coming environmental diag diagnostics. Um, so I'll mention one of uh, one of the larger 
EU projects during the seventh framework for, in the theme of agriculture and biotechnology, uh, was a collaboration called the Meta Explore, which was um, both several partners, uh, but also four small companies, where the aim was to identify novel enzymes for, with biodegradation capacity of particular recalcitrant and symbiotic compounds, uh, focusing on the, something called the chitinases, uh, dehalogenases, and lignin lacases. And particularly lignin lacases have had an interest when it comes to um, biofuel production. But this was uh, a few years ago, and also there was a lot of focus on, so on, on um, tools of how to more or less these cell factories, how to optimize. Because when it comes to production of these biocatalysis, um, the important part is, is how to produce uh, an enzyme or a biomolecule in an in active part, way. Uh, so a lot of effort was spent on that and, and vari using various strains, various hosts. Um, so these are artificial systems using eukaryotic systems in order to express some eukaryotic genes. And uh, to, I'm not going to go through all these different candidates and, and the results, but I'll mention just some of the interesting um, products that came out. And uh, so chitin is the second most abundant um, biopolymer in nature. It exists in uh, fungal uh, cell walls. It exists in cytoskeletons of, of insects. Uh, and it's really, re the, the chitin nases that degrade these polymers are really important for carbon and nutrient, uh, nitrogen cycling in nature. So this can be used in applications to produce chitosan, which can be used for drug delivery, um, could be for chito-oligosaccharides, and also for f um, controlling pathogens on crops. So in Europe and in other places in the world, where there's a, quite a loss to something called head blight, which is fungal crop pathogen, um, and also fruit waste. So there was, a, after screening several metagenomic libraries, with functional screening, uh, identifying um, chitinases that had certain properties. There was one chitinase which was active against various fungal pathogens. And uh, it also had was quite stable. So for a biocatalysis, it's important to have long-term stability, um, at also at acidic conditions, maybe high solvent tolerance. Um, and it seems to have been a fast screening, a rapid identification of um, a candidate. But producing, the, often the limit in all these types of um, metagenomic functional, metagenomic identification of novel enzymes, the limit comes to uh, production in a higher scale. So um, from in collaboration with some of these uh, small companies, uh, could produce them into uh, large-scale um, production with using a, a, a novel protein production platform for having uh, a good protein. And, and these formulations of proteins that are free, instead of using a, a complete organism that you cultivate and use that as a biocontrol agent, um, these formulations are rather few to date, and the advantage is that you can use them directly as spray on foliage, or you could use them as dip treatment for seeds, and so on. So that is uh, an advantage with these kind of products. I'll just briefly also mention um, some of the projects that we had in collaboration with um, um, people in Argentina and in the US, where we've looked at environments that are low temperature but still polluted. So at the top, it looks as if it's Svalbard, very nice, pristine environment, but actually it's rather polluted with um, old mining activities and harbor activities. So both having um, sites in Patagonia, Antarctica, the Baltic Sea, which is rather polluted, and uh, Svalbard, um, 
we've studied sediments and looked for certain biocatalysis and focused on, on, on certain types. And these are some of them, uh, alginate lyases, which are important in carbon turnover. The, the interesting enzyme genes are used as wound healing, therapeutics, and drug delivery. And, and why, why you go to sediments and low temperature environments? But there are actually clusters with novel genes, that could, for example, uh, in the Baltic Sea, compared to, other, to the known uh, alginate lyases. Uh, also, monoxygenases are examples of enzymes with uh, high application possibility in Sintrons in pharmaceuticals. Uh, and in ICS systems, they add oxygen to um, organic compounds. And some of these, they were uh, using in silico analysis first to just study the sequence and see what kind of compounds can dock to the active site. And then from there, select and do pre-sieve in order to go into these more functional screening and identify uh, active monogenesis. Um, also, anaerobic hydrocarbon degradation act capacity with a number of different enzymes. These are the genes encoding various enzymes and first pre-screening the environmental metagenomes to see whether there is existence of certain unique uh, enzyme genes and then going in and, and doing the screening. But all of this was very... Um, there was a lot of focus maybe 10 years ago on these type of methods. Then there was a drop-off because here, for example, from 2014 to 2017, you can see um, the different enzymes that have been identified. This is a uh, um, postdoc who made a review on that, and from soil, compost, water, and so on. There are not that many enzymes that were identified through functional metagenomics. And the limitation is, has been the actual expression and, and the production platform, often, and also having hit rates. Today, therefore, it has changed a lot. For over the past year or so, there are now new technologies that make screening so much more efficient. So for one day, you can screen billions and billions of clones. So 10 to the 6 metagenomic clones screen per day, compared to simple robotic screening a few years ago. And also assays that make it possible to identify. So it has really changed a lot the way we can identify uh, novel compounds. And not only enzymes, but also this is a recent publication of uh, Sean Brady and Rockefeller University that shows that screening 2,000 different soils in the US, first doing kind of genetic analysis, pre-sieving, and then screening s environmental libraries with so-called these back clones, bacterial artificial chromosomes, that can take large clusters that are important in order gene clusters to produce an antibiotic, you need a large gene cluster. Identified a completely novel calcium-dependent antibiotic, which is named the malacidines. And these malacidines have shown to be active on MRSA in animal systems. So still there's no... It hasn't gone through all the clinical steps, but this is really promising, and the hit rates are much higher. I'd just like to also mention the applicability of using environmental genomics, which is not really identifying a biocatalysis, but trying to understand soil health by looking at the genetic capacity, genetic uh, or also metabolic activity, so studying metatranscriptomics, and doing modeling approaches, and there's metaphenomics, which is one of the new omics words. There are all these... Jonathan Eisen has a website of bad omics words, but this is the latest me metaphenomics, and being able to, to make a judgment of the soil health and, and for the various agricultural purposes. And we also have the Oxford Nanopore Mini Ion pocket sequencer today we can just plug in. And just to finish, I think one of the last examples, I also work with the environmental reservoir, 
which is um, pathogens in the environment. And I find it very interesting because after the Ebola outbreak, uh, I think that in the future to use environmental genomics uh, for surveillance and, and decision support in order to uh, put together metadata both from um, metagene genomes, data from wildlife, environmental data, data from clinical studies, together to identify hotspots and rapidly maybe identify a pathogen in the field with a mobile sequencer. There's not that high quality yet for the, this um, mini-ion, but, but there are possibilities at least. I find that really um, fascinating. Uh, so this might uh, enable um, rapid identification of certain outbreaks um, and a surveillance system in the field. So I think to conclude some of the heading in the future, I think these large collaborations where you have standardized protocols are really promising and, and I think that is important to, to at least try to make it possible to facilitate these large, huge co collaborations. And uh, with the open uh, data sharing um, and investments in, in to use this standardization. So I think there was the question also, how, how do you compare the various data? Um, but also, since I'm a lot of focused in, in Södertörn University, we have focused on something called the Sustain Lab, where we also try to have... Um, uh, we've kind of sketched how we can interact with society uh, and with the research results. And some of that is, is focusing on, on transdisciplinary, truly transdisciplinary, not between different disciplines, in academia, but also non-academia. And uh, even interacting with um, NGOs and so on, in order to, to create knowledge and, and application and communicate this for a more sustainable society. Uh, and part of that is uh, really true participation and informed consent in this work, regardless if it's environmental genomics or studies that are not even within life sciences. So to engage the, the social engagement is, is very important. And I think it will be more and more important in the future. So I think I'll finish there. And I, if you haven't read Pilke, this interesting uh, book about how the scientist, what sci options a scientist has um, in order to deliver the science results to policy and politicians. And you could be the pure scientist or on the other scale, the honest broker. We would li all like to be the honest broker with delivering all kinds of possibilities and results, but often it could be the issue advocate having a hidden ag agenda, or we believe we're the pure scientists, but we're not. So thank you. Okay, so thank you very much for the presentation. We have some time for a couple questions for Sara Kueling. <clears throat> Luckily, I have some <laughs> questions prepared. Yes. So, uh, <clears throat> yeah, you, you talk about diversity. I, I actually did not think at first about the, the enzyme prospecting, which I think is very interesting. But then you mentioned that, that uh, they have quite a platform now, but there is for, for screening these. But there's a, st a step of pre-selection where you base on the genome. And then my question is, is how much of a, of a phenotype can we actually get from the genome? I mean, I understand that function can be guessed, but what about stability or catalytic activity? Mm -hmm. I mean, can those, are we at that stage yet that we can predict from the genome? No, I would say no. And I think also the optimal way is to screen by function immediately. No. Uh, but from experience, and that is why so many of these uh, um, attempts or projects have failed with low hit rates. So necessity has, has made it um, kind of, have, has developed these pre-sieving um, yeah, phase. But right. of course, if you have a, a certain um, motif that you know is important mm -hmm. for an antibiotic, 
then you could start to use that as a uh, indicator of what type of soils uh -huh. to start to screen. So I, th this is the way it's, it's being used in order to quickly screen through large. I see. Um, okay. So for, all right. Mm. So so you talked both about pro uh, bio mm. catalysts, but mm. also about whole pathways that can yes. that make mm. new compounds. And so both of those are on the table mm. for mm. developing further. I mm. guess. Yes. Mm? So those are the antibiotics are the metabolites from complete pathways. Exactly. Whereas if you have a esterase or, or chitinase, it's a little enzyme gene that you know, is easily produced. Mm. I can imagine there's a similar problem when we, we will talk about medicine tomorrow, that, that the genome is quite easy to get now and the proteome maybe as well, but I mean, there is the metabolome that is mm, something mm, that's mm. also uh, not mm, so easy mm, to, to get, especially mm, not in the no. community uh, of bacteria either out in the field. Mm. Um, I have another question then about uh, <clears throat> Uh, I, I'm at KTH, and there's this uh, a new fad when it comes to bioprospecting, and that is to try to recreate ancestral enzymes. Have you heard about uh, this, where they, they look at the the, phylo like the phylogenetic tree that you showed before, and they try to go backwards in time to create biocatalysis that maybe existed back when the Earth was hotter, for example, to try to get these properties that these you know, resiliency. Is this something that... Uh, mm. No, it's, it's quite intriguing that, that it's kind could be more possible. It's like diversity in space I and mean, time yeah. now, mm. you know? Mm. Like it's mm. not, a, not mm. just space, but also diversity in, mm. in, the, in mm. the evolutionary histories. Mm. And it's all based also on modeling. And, and uh, yeah. I guess the same with protein modeling. So the more proteins it's, uh, the structure is known and the better the models will become. And... and, and the more modeling, the, mm. the better the results will be. Mm. So, yes, but it is intriguing going back in, in time and yeah. trying to But, you know, it, it, somehow it yeah. feels like an academic exercise, mm. but it, there mm. could be something useful that comes out of mm. this. Uh, and then I have a, a last question then about, uh, about translation. This also gets into the next, next speaker, but uh, a translation to, uh, to industry. I mean, you mentioned some examples where, where you think that the, the field is quite hot now. But have you overseen some sort of, or do you know of success stories where, where it does get translated to industry? Like, for example, these new antibiotics. Is, is, it, is it going to work? Uh, this has had quite a lot of um, attention uh, since it's quite an, it's a novel group. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, it could be just like a little candidate. But th right. this is a complete group. Okay. Uh, yeah. But yeah. that is too early to say. But the, of course, there are also examples that have failed, but may not failed because of technological functional, but failed because of ethical reasons. Aha, uh -huh, okay. And those are, uh, we might discuss those later. Yes, exactly. So I those have are written down. I mean, cases. do we care that the proteins we mm. add to something are genetically modified mm. originally? Do mm. we care about that? I mean, we talk or about DNA, but you're talking also about mm. proteins you add to things that may wind up, eat, we, may, we mm. may wind up eating them. And in this case, we don't really know where they come from. We don't yeah. know the original organism. Uh, but these were other exactly. ethical uh, yeah, reasons yeah, yeah. that um, made it difficult. Mm. Yes, Bjorn. I have a question. Can you understand convergence through the diversity, seeing what is not varied in the diversity aspects? So, see, see in because you have such a vast database of diversity, could you see here we see no variation whatsoever, which would then maybe mm. imply something about structure or function or whatever. Mm. Mm. Uh, yes, and, uh, actually there, there's a whole field that is more or less focusing on, on, uh, on those type of analysis. And also the, there are novel tools now that uh, are used and even from uh, phylogenetic information, uh, it's, uh, these novel tools are using the absolute kind of sequence read and comparing that, which means that you really have high resolution, you have all the information there. So yes, I can't really answer exactly those questions because I'm, I haven't been uh, focusing on that. But there are um, the research areas that are completely yeah. uh, focusing on these. It's <gasps> a really. Yeah. I was going to say that's a very interesting question. I mean, we, we talked about earlier about a lack, like losing diversity. And then, you know, you think that you can see when the lions are endangered, but you can't always see when the bacteria are endangered. So to be able to go out in the field and, and sequence a lot of DNA really quick could give an, an idea of if how quickly we're losing bacterial diversity. So thank you again, Sarah. Thank you.